So looking at metabolic health, again, because you do a lot of labs at your clinic, if someone wanted to go just look at the most important markers for metabolic health, which would they be and which numbers are the ideal ranges that yeah. you love? So you and I were talking about this before, but they're, they're, a lot of this is pre-pandemic data. But I think it's a UNC report study that, that cited around only 93% of participants, let me say it this other, other way, only 7% of participants hit the criteria for optimal metabolic health. 93% of the, the sort of, 93% of people don't have good metabolic health. And I think when you look at the conventional you know, standards, they're, they're a little bit loose. They're looking at statistical bell curve averages of just, just general population. So they're not even the functional ranges, the optimal. They're just average ranges. So I would have even tighter, more optimal ranges. So it's probably- and you'd even, have like 3%. <laughs> yeah, we probably 3% of people are, would check all the boxes for optimal metabolic health. So this is where I want the numbers to be. Uh, glucose, your fasting blood sugar to be under 90. HDL, or good cholesterol to be above 59. Triglycerides or circulating. Men and women, doesn't matter? Doesn't matter. Why do that. they always have the men and women different on that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'd want it to be the 60s and 70s for both men and women. Yeah. So you, I'm sure there probably, there could be different reasons between men and women. But as long as we're above 59, I see great outcomes and people feel great. Yeah. So I don't have to have it significantly different. So HDL above 59, triglycerides under 100. Um, the A1C to be under 5.6, you could say 5.7. That's your three-month average of your blood sugar. Um, Where would you really love that to be? 5.4 would be beautiful. That'd be beautiful. Um, I mean, you could run, you could, we do this, but... Uh, when it's needed wearing like a continuous glucose monitor for a month and looking at their glucose spikes and dips throughout the, the month and seeing the f how food stress and sleep impact their blood sugar, but having optimal blood balance throughout the blood sugar balance throughout the month and inflammation markers, high, sensi high sensitivity, C reactive protein to be under one homocysteine to be under seven. Um, we would run what's called a nuclear magnetic resonance test, NMR test, You'd want small dense LDL particles, which are a specific, they're the particles that carry um, LDL around. They're the oxidized sort of inflamed particles that carry cholesterol around. We want this to be under 950. We want to be in pattern A, which is the fluffy buoyant, large buoyant LDL particles. And um, yeah, so those are, uh, when you look at that, um, the NMR test, the, the cardiometabolic uh, testing and the comprehensive uh, metabolic tests. LabCorp will also assess insulin resistance score. So I, if I can get that test with LabCorp, um, if they're not going through Quest, I could look at their IR score as well. I want that to be as low as possible. So when you're looking at just metabolic health, those are what I would pick. Um, there'd be a few other ones. APOB would be one. LP little A would be another one. Um, and these are all conventional tests. Mm -hmm. Like none of these are like, right, functional medicine fringe tests. They're just not typically all ran. Some of them are ran, obviously, but not all together. Um, and if it could be super picky, like looking at magnesium, vitamin D would be super helpful for metabolic health. Still and blows system. my mind that we do not regularly do vitamin D. Yeah, like, and, and I just it's difficult for it. coverage for some people with their insurance. Yeah, it's it shouldn't stop them. I mean, we'll find a way to get it for them. Because this is should be paramount that everybody's running a magnesium, RBC, and a vitamin D. And the critical thing here is those numbers you just said, like if you look at the labs, the ranges are not that. Yeah. And so that's the biggest challenge with this whole metabolic health thing is the ranges are too high. And so if you get to this, because it's a process over time, like you don't wake up with poor metabolic health. Yeah. Right? It's a process. Yeah. Well, but yeah, by the time somebody's diagnosed, it's about four to 10 years prior that diagnosis, that things are brewing on that sort of dysregulation continuum. Now, if I was benevolent dictator... Yeah, what would you do? <laughs> I'm going to know. I would add in a grip strength test and a VO2 max test. Yeah. And a balance test. Like, I would look like, like you know, if 
a VO2, uh, exercise fixes a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. They used to always say you can't out exercise a bad diet. I go, well, it can actually make a big dent. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> well, yeah. And you, with food is not going to be directly correlated to grip strength. I mean, there's going to be some things that exercise that is going to move the needle for longevity and health span. So, I mean, it would be fabulous if you went to your healthcare provider, they did a DEXA scan, they did a grip strength, they did like a jump test, they did a VO2 max, then they did all of those ones as well, then you'd really have some direction to go. Should be standard. I mean, hey, you should be part of these um, the incoming initiatives. I should have gone to that ball. 